Hi, it's The Wire. August 29th, 2024. Gamblersadvisory.com, a free site. Also, money1776.com, a free site. Let's talk boxing. Let's talk boxing history. Let's go outside the corporate construct and image that the sport is trying to portray right now. Let's talk about the actual roots. But first remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now let me say boxing is trying desperately to portray itself as a civil sport. Right? You will see people like Michael Buffer in the ring. This is part of boxing culture. And he'll be wearing a tux. Jimmy Lennon will be wearing a tux as they introduce the fighters. Right? You know, people will show up to fights not wearing baggy clothes and uh, t-shirts. No, the culture is you show up to a fight and you look like you're wearing elegant clothes. You look like you're at a cocktail party hosted by some wealthy person. Right now, that's where boxing wants to take you. They understand that the actual sport involves people trying to give the other person a concussion. Right? Fighters celebrating when they have knocked the other person unconscious with their corner, right? They're jumping up and down in the ring as the opponent lays on the canvas, unable to move. Right? Understand, some people have been badly hurt in the sport. Some people have been killed in the sport. Right? The sport tries desperately to make those events look like outliers. Now, I love boxing. But understand, there are going to be people who love dangerous sports like boxing and bullfighting and professional football in the United States. Right? Let's not kid ourselves. The roots of the sport are vastly different. Boxing, quite frankly, has the same problem that jazz has. Where you find out that some of the greats, right, Charlie Parker, Miles Davis, John Coltrane, right, some of the greats who would be on the Mount Rushmore of the sport had problems. We're imperfect. Aren't we all imperfect? lived politically incorrect lives. Now, what I want people to understand is in boxing, there's a conscious effort to hide the past. Let's talk about a surefire first ballot Hall of Famer. Folks, he's one of the best in the sport. He's one of the best interviews in the sport. He's been on his game the last three weeks if you've been tracking his statements. Right? Saul Alvarez recently said, look, I'm not saying I won't fight Crawford. Right? Alvarez is criticizing David Benavides. He said, look, this guy went to 175 pounds and he didn't do anything there. Now it stings because, of course, Canelo was the champ at 175 after he beat Kovalev. Right? Canelo is a little bit hard right now on a young, aspiring Edgar Belanga. Right? Canelo's saying, hey, I'm not going to have mercy this fight. The implication is he had mercy in some other fights. Many people, let me raise my hand, are wondering how Jaime Munguia went the distance. Right? That seemed to me to be an act of charity. Well, I want people to understand that Canelo has more fights than his record. Right now, folks, to the boxing press. This is a fighter, high profile, <laughs> operating in broad daylight. This is not Kamala Harris. Canelo actually talks to the press. Yes, that was a 
cheap shot. Right? Canelo gives interviews. Canelo tells you what he thinks about not just himself, but fighters like David Benavides. To the boxing press, talk with the fighter. Understand, Canelo came up. This is boxing. Some guys are a little bit too young when they start their careers. There seems to be an effort to cover up the fact that Canelo actually beat a number of people. Unofficial. It's not on his record. But yet, this is one of the highest profile guys in the sport. Well, right now, and this figure is very important, I believe he's a threat to the heavyweight title, right? Has made a mistake in taking the Fraser Clark rematch. Understand, technicians like Clark have learning curves. Right? Your best time to beat them is before they figure you out. The rematch is going to be difficult. But I need for the world right now to focus on Fabio Wardley. He's two-handed. You will not find a fighter who comes across in a naturally classy way in an interview. More so than Fabio Wardley. He's a great interview. Right? He's a guy who can say the hardest things in interviews and make it sound well packaged, right? Totally classy. He's an excellent ambassador for the sport. Here's the problem. He came up in private exhibitions. In the United Kingdom, they call this white collar boxing. Folks, this is off the books. Right? This is completely off the books. This is where wealthy people recruit people and have private fights. It sounds barbaric. It sounds ridiculous. Folks, it's part of boxing history. So Fabio Wardley, who wasn't an Olympian, doesn't have an extensive amateur pedigree, He's just a strong bro bloke off the street. Was in a ring before some wealthy people with some other strong looking guy and they would have at it. Now it's because in that world, and that world still exists, it's because Fabio Wardley excelled in that world that he now is fighting at places like the O2. He now has the big deal from Frank Warren, who of course handles Tyson Fury's career, handles Zhili Zhang's career. Understand, a private exhibition guy now is in the top 10 in the heavyweight division. And quite frankly, it's the flaws that make the diamond. Because technicians for at least the first four rounds aren't going to know what the hell Fabio Wardley is doing. And because Wardley can knock you out with both hands. In my opinion, he's a guy who, if you're looking for a long shot with a chance to stop anyone in the division, Right? He's a guy you need to keep an eye on. Well, let's talk about white-collar boxing. Let's talk about two of the biggest names in boxing history. Right? Now, this situation has a certain personal uh, level for me. Because my favorite boxer in history is Jack Johnson. Right? I was raised in a household where my dad loved Joe Lewis. You know, Joe Lewis was to leave it to Beaver-ish for me. Right? I saw Joe Lewis. I thought, oh, gee, this guy looks boring. Right? Back then, there was a heavyweight, Muhammad Ali. And Ali, just even in the 70s, just moved better than Joe Lewis could on his best day. Right? But my dad loved Lewis. Lewis, of course, was a wordsmith, some of the best quotes in boxing. 
right? He said of Billy Kahn, he can run, but he can't hide, and stuff like that. The real Joe Lewis, believe it or not, is from the streets. The real Joe Lewis, who had a felon in his corner, right, who was very good friends with Sonny Liston, who was very good friends with alleged mobsters when he moved to Las Vegas, who literally saved the career of Sugar Ray Robinson, right? The real Joe Lewis knew his way around the streets. The real Joe Lewis, his name wasn't even Joe Lewis, right? It was Joe Barrow, is much more interesting than the image that my dad loved of Joe Lewis, you know, doing army exhibitions and stuff like that. Well, for me, the very top of the sport is Jack Johnson, right? This is the best. That's how I consider him. I'm not saying his fight style would have led to him uh, beating fighters who came after him. But understand, this is a paradigm shift in boxing, right? The big moments are often unrecorded. Jack Johnson was in the ring with a guy. The guy beat him up. Lewis could not figure it out. Excuse me, Johnson could not figure it out. Of course, back then, we'll say boxing was illegal in some places. The cops raided the event. The cops arrested both guys. They threw the guys in the same jail cell. Now, the reason the story has credibility is the story comes from Jack Johnson. This is who he was. Right? He was the champ who could talk to the press and say, yeah, this guy was beating me up. I didn't know what was going on. So, in prison, Johnson talks to the more veteran fighter and says, what was I doing wrong in the fight? And from that conversation, Johnson understood that he wasn't the fighter he thought he was and that he needed to be more technical. So what happens is you have a black guy from Galveston, Texas, who is taking a technical view of the sport. And it's Jack Johnson, folks, if you look at the films, who brings defense to the heavyweight division. Right? He's doing pull counters. He's big time on clinching, right? He can fight you inside. He doesn't want to be the lead. He wants to be the counter, right? Folks, back then, this is revolutionary, right? And understand, he's dealing with an incredibly hostile press that somehow wanted people to believe in an era after Peter Jackson, right? Know that name. Understand, when Johnson wins the heavyweight title, he goes to Peter Jackson's grave. That was important to him. And talks to Jackson's grave, right? Just understand that back then, black fighters were supposed to be too afraid to fight white guys in big fights, right? So Tommy Burns, who was a knockout puncher, understand Tommy Burns is a dominant heavyweight champ. He's a smaller guy. Folks, he was a knockout puncher. You want to think Mike Tyson in thinking about Tommy Burns, right? Just understand before their first fight, well, before their only fight, right? Tommy Burns was going around calling Jack Johnson yellow. Now, that fight's very important because there's a film on the lead-in to that fight. Whatever you think of Australia, and I know the country's had problems, on film, the people were feared of Jack Johnson. The people came around. There's a film of the training camp. Folks, Jack Johnson is popular. Right, this is a black man, <laughs> this is a black man shortly after the turn of the century, 
preparing for a fight in Australia. We'll understand how that fight starts. Right, Johnson comes to the middle of the ring, looks at Tommy. Then after they break and they come to the ring, according to legend, Jack Johnson tells the heavyweight champion, Here I am, Tommy. Now who told you I was yellow? Proceeds to take the title, just like there is no film of the first pitch to Jackie Robinson in 1947. Right? There is no film of Jack Johnson's stoppage of Tommy Burns. The camera people were ordered to turn off their cameras. Now, I'm not going to talk too much more about Jack Johnson. Let's just say he's my favorite. Here's what I want you to consider. Johnson, who becomes the first black heavyweight champion, ends up being condemned by the NAACP. Right? Why? Because Johnson, who had been with black women, uh, starts dating white women. Right? Johnson, of course, is a guy who is a man about town. Right? It's Johnson who opens the nightclub in Harlem that later becomes the Cotton Club. Right? So the NAACP, they wanted a Joe Lewis type figure. Right? Understand, by the time Lewis comes around, they actually tell Lewis, if you knock down a white guy, don't linger over the guy. Right Now contrast that with Jack Johnson, who after getting dropped by Stanley Ketchell, another historical figure, the middleweight champion, Johnson gets off the canvas, Johnson decks Ketchell, some of Ketchell's teeth are on Johnson's glove. And Johnson, looking over at Ketchell, flicks the teeth off his glove. Right? So Johnson, rejected by the NAACP, right, had a stock answer, he would say to people, when they asked him about why he was making the decisions he was making, why he was leading the lifestyle he was leading, right? People knew Johnson was a guy who would go to whorehouses. I'm not kidding. Right? Johnson was a guy who would get around. Right? Johnson had a stock response. That response was, I am not a slave. Right? This is the Libertarian as heavyweight champion. Now the Dempsey story is interesting because Dempsey is like Joe Lewis. Right? These two guys could be brothers. You know, you heard me say Lewis is from the streets. Right? Lewis is not who you think he is. Lewis is running in some hard circles. They then later clean up the guy. This is decades after Johnson, they clean up the guy. So the guy becomes the brown bomber. <laughs> so the guy becomes an American hero. Right? Understand Dempsey hung around whorehouses. According to reports, he worked in whorehouses. He was the local tough guy helping the operation run. There's an infamous fight against fireman Jim Flynn, a name you need to know, right? Jim Flynn gets around, right? He fought Johnson, um, lost that fight. He ends up fighting Jack Dempsey. This is like the fight Sonny Liston lost, right? Dempsey gets knocked out in the first round. There are two sides of history. One has... Dempsey, young, inexperienced, getting caught by a savvy veteran fighter who had already fought for the heavyweight title. The other, just like with Sonny Liston, the other is that Dempsey threw the fight. That Dempsey throws the fight, leaves the state, starts fighting in California. I'm not kidding. Well, understand, Dempsey was viewed with admiration 
by people like Al Capone to the point where when Dempsey had a falling out with Doc Kearns, Al Capone offered to sponsor his career. Right? That's Dempsey's the guy from the streets who decides he's going to be a gentleman who seems to have gone through the same charm school that Joe Lewis went through. These are some of the biggest names in boxing history. Comes out the other side and he has improved his wardrobe. He watches what he says to the press. Occasionally stories come out of four guys attacking Jack Dempsey as he leaves an event. Who knows what that's about, right? You realize Jack Dempsey had a number of wives, right? You realize Jack Dempsey was, you know, a guy's guy back then. But Dempsey tried to make himself into someone prim and proper. Let me add this too about Jack Johnson. An arrest warrant issued for Jack Johnson during his career. Jack Johnson then goes on the lam, escapes through Canada, makes it to Paris. So this becomes the heavyweight champ who's hanging out in cafes with polite society. Right, folks? Johnson makes the social part, in my opinion, of the heavyweight title. Right? This is the celebrity heavyweight champion. Right? The U.S. government's not on his side. They claim that Teddy Roosevelt, you know, slammed his hand on a table when he learned that Johnson had beat Jeffries. Right? U.S. government is after him, wants to arrest him. He's now been pardoned. Right? But the Mann Act at the time, you know, understand, Johnson was friends with prostitutes. Johnson is helping a friend, right? She's not even, <laughs> she's not even someone who Johnson, you know, has a business relationship with. And because she's a prostitute and they crossed state lines, they came after him. On, as every law student knows, one of the most unconstitutional bills in American history. Put it this way. The Mann Act was so unconstitutional that both Harry Reid and John McCain at one point jointly urged then-President Barack Obama to pardon Jack Johnson. Right? Just figure it out, right? Uh, the airport, well, let's just say Harry Reid is esteemed in the state of Nevada uh, I believe there's an airport named after him. Um, just do the math on that. So, the reason for this video is because the Brooklyn Eagle, on December 11th, 1921, a Brooklyn newspaper, had an article in which they discussed a private exhibition off the books. Right? Wealthy people. The kind of setup that Fabio Wardley has just graduated from. They described a private exhibition involving a fight between 43-year-old Jack Johnson after he left prison and 27-year-old Jack Dempsey. Right now, history, of course, has debated this. Did this actually happen in Saskatchewan, Canada? an out-of-the-way place. Right? Here's what you need to know. The Brooklyn Eagle contacted the newspaper in Saskatchewan to confirm the story. Right, folks? They were seeking verification on the story. They believed the story. Jack Dempsey, who later in life, becomes a big-time restaurateur in New York City, um, is hobnobbing with, you know, powerful people in New York City. He's a icon of the sport. This is after a stretch where he needed money, was bankrupt, was actually acting as a referee. Right? Kind of like Benny Leonard, one of the great 
lightweights in history. Right? Well, just to understand, Dempsey, who molds himself into a bit of a gentleman, wouldn't dispute that it happened. Right? Now, folks need to understand that when you're dealing with wealthy people and illegal events, private exhibitions that are unlicensed, and understand too, our idea of sports governance in 2024 is very different than what it was in 1921. But people need to understand that there has to be confidentiality. If the people putting on the fight, and these are wealthy people with influence, enough influence to get the reigning heavyweight champion and the former heavyweight champion, into a, an undisclosed location that only the other members of the private audience know about, right? They were able to get both of these guys to Canada. There has to be confidentiality because wealthy people don't want to be part of a conspiracy to put on an illegal event, right? But I need for folks to recognize, too, that when you're dealing with wealthy people, the participants in the room are going to be fully compensated. Right? You can imagine. I'm not saying this happened, but hypothetically. If Warren Buffett, right? Berkshire, by the way, is now a trillion dollar company. Just food for thought. If Warren Buffett were to get together with Bill Gates, who he knows, right? Uh, Mark Cuban, Elon Musk. And they said, hey, you know what? I'd love to see this fight. They understand that Johnson, a black man out of prison, by the way, Johnson earns a patent while in prison, creating a wrench, just food for thought. This is the heavyweight champ who's actually privately an intellectual who is a patent holder, right? Johnson, of course, spoke more than one language. Um, if wealthy people realize that Johnson... Um, wasn't going to be granted a license by the United States because they did not want him fighting again. Right? Think about it. He's 43. They did not want him fighting again. Understand, too, race riots broke out after the Jeffries fight. Um, you know, the last interracial heavyweight title fight to take place in the United States was Johnson against Fireman Flynn. That fight ends because Fireman Flynn starts doing headbutts and things like that, right? So Johnson's a controversial figure. It's unlikely, even for the well-connected, to be able to set things up where Johnson would be able to legally resume his career, right? Jurisdictions are afraid to have Johnson. Right? Johnson is the black guy at a time of Jim Crow, right? who you know is sleeping with women outside his race. Understand, you have another one of Dwyer's all-time favorites, Marcus Garvey, right? who you know has black people, this is early 20s, right? You know, thinking globally. Right? New racial identity. You actually have a crowd that's outside of Booker T. Washington as well as NC, uh, NAACP um, orthodoxy. Right? So, Johnson, legally, if you're going to organize a fight with Johnson, it's kryptonite. Then you have Dempsey. Dempsey has just beaten George's Carpentier in the heavyweight division's first million dollar fight. Right? Dempsey brings the heavyweight division to new heights. You have a greater than million dollar purse for that Carpentier fight. I believe Dempsey, this is early 20s. This is a guy who ultimately ends up declaring bankruptcy. I believe Dempsey makes $300,000 for that fight. Right? Understand, Holmes, in the early 70s, decades later, were selling for $30,000 in places like San Diego, California, 
right? So you can imagine $300,000. Back then, Dempsey should have been able to walk away from the sport. Well, let me just say, we know what happened in the fight. Folks, I'm a Johnson fan. I believe this fight actually took place. Right now, just at first glance, I would expect Dempsey to win. Because Dempsey is the fighter. He's a paradigm shift. He's the fighter who brings movement around the ring, away from the pocket, into the heavyweight division. Right? You see these old fighters, right? Uh, Jim Jeffries, uh, John L. Sullivan, and they're hanging around the pocket and everyone's like this. Right? It's Dempsey who is moving around the ring, right? That's big for the heavyweight division. Johnson didn't have that movement, right? Johnson is great defensively. But Johnson, you know, wasn't a guy who is going to, you know, be episodic like Jack Dempsey. Also, Dempsey had a 16-year advantage on Johnson, right? Johnson's 43, Dempsey 27. But apparently it's Jack Johnson who comes out. He hurts Dempsey. Dempsey is getting battered by the end of the third round. In the fifth round, the old man off a right hand drops the then reigning heavyweight champion, Jack Dempsey. Dempsey gets off the canvas. Dempsey then hurts Jack Johnson in the sixth round. Dempsey then hops in deep pocket in the seventh round. Throws a right hook to Johnson's jaw and ends the fight. Right now that's the report. A great fight. Both heavyweights getting knockdowns. Right? Understand. If you believe that Johnson is better in the pocket and was the better defensive fighter, it makes sense that Johnson would have control, but as a 43-year-old, against a fighter who was a great athlete. Power in both hands. Punches from odd angles. Volume. Right? It makes sense that sooner or later, youth aggression would take over right so here's what here's what we know and let me point out too uh, when Johnson got out of prison he called out Jack Dempsey right of course Johnson had beaten fireman Flynn who knocked out Dempsey if you believe that fight was on the up and up the Dempsey Flynn fight of course Johnson loses his title to Jess Willard, who, of course, Dempsey destroys. Right? So both of these guys were interested in fighting each other. Now that much we know. Let me also say, too, that the Dempsey-George Carpentier fight takes place July the 2nd, 1921. Dempsey does not fight again officially until March the 9th, 1922. This fight is supposed to have taken place someplace between those two dates. Right? Just understand. <laughs> both guys, both guys may well have been in Canada. Right? Johnson, of course, starts fighting exhibitions in Canada. Canada in 1923. Right? There's no evidence that these guys weren't in Saskatchewan in early December of 1921. And this would have been the height of Jack Dempsey because he had just beaten Carpentier who people thought of as a formidable opponent. On Gambler's Advisory Dot com, you will see a crowd. It's a photo of a crowd in Times Square, Manhattan. And they're waiting to hear the outcome. Folks, it's a crowd. The street's packed. 
They're waiting to hear the outcome of the Dempsey Carpentier fight. Right, so after Dempsey beats Carpentier, you could easily see a situation. Since the white collar private exhibition boxing world exists, of Dempsey being offered big money to fight Jack Johnson, Dempsey taking the fight. Because, of course, Johnson's 43 years old. Dempsey's 27 in his prime, on top, heavyweight king. Right? Also, there would be no downside. Right? Assuming the guys leave the fight healthy. If Dempsey were to lose to a 43-year-old, no one would know. Because these events have confidentiality. Right? People can't be associated with illegal events like this. Right? So, just understand what ultimately happens. People knew about this fight. This fight became folklore, right? Johnson never mentions it, but you could understand the fighters pledging to confidentiality. So, a guy named Lou Eskrin becomes the editor of Boxing Illustrated, right? He's at some award ceremony and he runs into Jack Johnson. Right? He's loaded for beer. He has the facts about the fight. He knows about the Brooklyn Eagle, December 11th, 1921 article. He goes up to Johnson. He says to Johnson, did this fight happen? All an older Johnson would say, this is in the mid-80s. <laughs> All an older Johnson would say was, I always said I could beat, excuse me, all the older Jack Dempsey would say was, I always said I could beat Johnson. That was Dempsey's response. Let me repeat it. I always said I could beat Johnson. So Eskrin continues to communicate with Dempsey and says, hey, I want to disclose this fight in Boxing Illustrated. And Dempsey just said, not now, which Eskrin in Eskin interpreted as when I'm gone, you can then discuss the story. Right? I believe given that folks like Al Capone wanted to become Dempsey's manager, the people involved in this exhibition may well have made it clear that any violation of uh, the confidentiality understanding uh, could lead to problems. Now let's make the argument as to why this fight may not have taken place. Dempsey breaks up with Doc Kearns, his manager. Kearns turns on Dempsey. In the 1960s, Kearns then gives an interview with Sports Illustrated where he, of course, accuses Dempsey of cheating during the Jess Willard fight. He accuses Dempsey of having loaded gloves for that fight. Right now, one wonders why Kearns didn't take the extra step and say, you know, we had an illegal fight against Jack Johnson. And the 43-year-old not far removed from his year in prison, actually dropped Jack Dempsey. Right? One would have thought Kearns would have taken shots on Dempsey and talked about that exhibition as well as some others. But Kearns didn't. But an argument can be made that if in fact that private exhibition involved organized crime figures, Right? It's possible that Kearns himself understood that there were limits to what he could talk about. So just understand, Jack Johnson never talked about this exhibition. Jack Dempsey, the most he would say about it is, I always said I could beat Johnson. That's all he'd say about it. I believe the fight actually took place. Right? We, you know, Dempsey is a guy who 
you can track where he is most of the time. This is that strange period during Dempsey's reign as heavyweight champion where he's off the grid. As for Johnson, Johnson needed money when he left prison. He understood the feds were all over him. Right? Now, Johnson, of course, did make money off his wrench. Right? But you can imagine if anybody would understand that money under the table is tax-free, that this would be a way for him to pay a lot of bills, it would be Jack Johnson. Right? So, do some Google searches. Look this one up. Exhibition. Jack Dempsey versus Jack Johnson. Let me just say this. Years ago, someone came up to me and told me that the great Jimi Hendrix uh, once did a private recording with The Doors' Jim Morrison. Right? Two personal favorites of mine. And I laughed and I said, who told you that story? It was the most preposterous thing I had ever heard of in my life. Until, of course, the person came back with the recording. Right, I woke up this morning and I found myself dead. That's the name of the demo, right? Obviously, the two guys had issues, right? Um, you know, they were intoxicated. Uh, Morrison, of course, would later die. In fact, both guys would die of what were suspected to be drug overdoses. But understand, you know, these things sound weird until proof emerges, right? Saskatchewan, Canada. A few months after the George Carpentier fight, Jack Dempsey, a guy who, you know, comes from a rough part of town, is alleged to have thrown a fight, um, you know, was once attacked, we know, by four guys after he was leaving some establishment. Um, Dempsey, of course, defended himself, right? Um, and, of course, Jack Johnson, a guy who would hit whorehouses, a guy who knew several prostitutes, a guy who opened a club in New York City, a guy who had been around, loses his title in Cuba because he cannot legally fight in the United States. Right, The idea of those two guys, two of the biggest names in the sports history, having a private exhibition, as Fabio Wardley, I'm sure, knows, is very possible. I believe the story is likely true. Google the Brooklyn Eagle. Google December 11th, 1921. The article will pop up. It's worth a read. Those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours in the comment section of this YouTube video. Thanks for stopping by.